one prophet. He's got everything he needs. As long as he knows where he's hiding, so he doesn't know where he comes from. He packs it up and leaves the earth. He calls it Axel Colvin and claims it all for himself. And because he owns it, he owns all of us. So yeah, just the yeah, last comment. I think what you see here is, you know, a that you know have meaningful social connections, as opposed to just violence. And what you see there is, I think, the description of the social aspect of environmental degradation. You know, that he controls the water, therefore he controls all of us. So interstellar, you know, it's all technological. Here, it's actually more focused on socio-political issues. All right, I'll just leave it at that. I'll just hold this one. Um, when I think about science fiction and our future, um, I immediately am aware of a lot of science fiction that suggests that I ought to fear the future. Um, a number of films that come to mind, Brazil, Blade Runner, Transcendence, Ex Machina, Minority Report, The Matrix, or literature, 1984, Frankenstein, uh, Fahrenheit 451, there will come soft rains, um, and even the, the video game Bioshock. Um, just a few examples that I thought of, and I'm sure we could think of a lot more. Um, one, um, I had a little cassette tape when my children were young that had a couple of Ray Bradbury stories on it that we would listen to, and one of them was The Velt. Are any of you familiar with this short story, The Velt? Okay, some of you are. I wanted to focus on it um, very briefly. Um, for this discussion about why we should be afraid of the future, or, or should we be, or why is science fiction giving us that message? Um, so, just a really brief summary of the Velt. Um, um, a mom and a dad, a son and a daughter, live in an entirely automated house. The house cooks for them, feeds them, washes them, ties their shoes, brushes their teeth, puts them to bed, rocks them to sleep. The house does everything for them. And um, there's a very special room in the house that's the nursery that we're told they spent a lot more money for the nursery. And the nursery is exceptional. It's cutting edge technology. And it, um, um, it's able to deliver to the children anything that they can imagine, a, another country, a fairy tale, anything. So I'm just going to play you a little clip of uh, when the father, so the father early on in the story, he d he's going to go fishing with his son. This is significant. And uh, then when he's just about to leave to go fishing, he gets a call from work and work says, oh, well, we need you to come in. And Oh shoot, really, does it have to be today? Yeah, we'll send the helicopter. And so he disappoints his son, and we get the feeling that he disappoints his son once again. And, uh, but he's trying to make it up to his son by saying, hey, we'll come in and look at the nursery. There's, look, it can be anything you want. But his son is pretty sulky. Anyway, I'll play this a couple, a minute or so, and you can see for yourself. Um, you'll just, this is only audio, so we don't need to worry about the lights. Is this all there is? It's just a big empty room. Aha, it only looks empty. It's a machine. Make a wish. Ah, uh, nothing, Paris. 
Egypt now. Shape pyramids of white hot stone. Carve sphinx from ancient sand and wind. Do you see, Jewel? Come on closer. Don't stand like right there. So um, he tries to get the children involved, and maybe you could tell that it was mostly he and his wife that were ooing and aahing about what the nursery produced. And the children hang back, and he tries to invite them forward and say, come on, uh, try anything. And they're, um, they're still sulking about the fishing trip that they don't get, and they're not that interested. Um, anyway, George goes off to work. Ultimately, what happens is that... Um, um, the, the wife, Lydia, feels like there's something wrong with the nursery, that it's stuck in uh, Africa, and that uh, they ought to check it out. They go and they investigate, and they hear screams coming from the nursery and uh, on a couple of occasions, and something's wrong, and they go in, and they're very disturbed by what they see. Africa, they see some lions uh, feeding on what they think is a carcass of an animal. Um, but they find a bloody wallet that's all chewed up, and it turns out that it's George's wallet. And so there's, there are these suggestions that something's really not okay. Well, they call the psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist comes and examines the nursery, and um, he advises them to shut it down. He tells them that their children hate them, and they're incredulous. They hate us. We're their parents, and we've given them everything. And the psychiatrist explains that no, you, you've only given them machines, you know. That, and so, so in the end, they say, okay, we're going to leave. We're going to shut off the house. And the children are very upset, very, very upset. And, uh, and George uh, and his son have a big confrontation, and he winds up breaking a part of the machine, and the son says, I hate you, I hate you. And then uh, he feels bad the next day when they're going to move, and so he lets the children go into the nursery for one last time, and while they're just getting ready to leave, they hear, these, they hear the children screaming, Mom, Dad, help, help. And they run into the nursery to help the children that they think they're in danger. And then the nursery door shuts behind them. And then the lions come and, and eat them and kill them. So, <laughs> yikes. So um, a clearly a cautionary tale Bradbury is telling that where I should be very afraid of technology and the role that it uh, plays in, in my life, in my children's life. Well, I just got interested in that question. Should we be afraid of technology? Why? I, I poked around a little bit, and, and you know, just for your information, I discovered that um, post-humanist theory um, in, indicates that one of the reasons why science fiction often uh, has this theme of caution and fear is because of the binaries that are used, um, namely like um, body machine, non-human human. And posthumanism argues that if we, that we try, we should try and get rid of those binaries and we should try to have a more complex understanding of uh, any science fiction text, and if we did. And, and as I applied that, I realized that um, it, it helped me to come to a, a sort of a better understanding, one that's not so cut and dried that I should just be afraid. For instance, um, uh, posthumanism suggests uh, that we consider liminality uh, and that we apply liminality. Now, what is, what is liminality? In, to apply this to our understanding of technology, what is it? Liminality is a, is a term that was coined by an anthropologist named Victor Turner. And it, it, is, it describes a temporary or in-between stage. A good example of a liminal stage is adolescence. When I'm a teenager, I am, I am I'm not one thing or another. I'm in between. I am no longer a child, not yet an adult. I am in between. And so the application of liminality can help us to understand the complexities of a text, its ambiguities. For instance, if we are to look at this story, The Velt, technology is more than one thing. On the one hand, it is... Um, 
what, what was the term I wanted to use? It, it is a very impressive enabler, right? It can, in this nursery, I can say Paris, France, and it, it can create that, and that's very impressive. At the same time, it's also dangerous. If, if I abdicate my, all my responsibility to my children and I don't tie their shoes and wash them and hold them and read to them um, and abdicate my responsibility to technology. So it can be both of those things. Um, another example of a, of a binary that is deconstructed by this post-humanist view would be um, extrinsic intrinsic. So um, within the binary, technology is understood as completely extrinsic to humanity. Um, and that, that's true, the machine's out there and I'm here. But at the same time, if if technology is such a part of my life that it's in, in, that it, that it's in uh, my daily life, in my day-to-day -day habits, then it, it has an intrinsic quality where it can definitely have an influence on my relationships. So in conclusion, my, my I guess, post-humanist reading of, of a science fiction text which, which wants me to be afraid of technology is just that, um, the parents in this story, they realize that by abdicating their responsibility to technology, their relationship with their children has suffered fatally. Um, the machine has replaced them, which is, of course, our greatest fear in regards to technology, right? But having avoided a dualistic view of the story, we can appreciate that it isn't the machine in the story that we need to be afraid of, but rather our choices in regards to the machine. Thank you. Let's just swap. I've got my own. I just wanted this one. Okay, I try to make this really brief. Um, this kind of ties right nicely into what you said last. Okay, so um, if posthumanism really pr uh, proposes this, that we sort of start um, living in the liminal, it's hard to say, living in the liminal, um, then um, transhumanism, and I'm just saying this to set him up because he knows everything about transhumanism and he's going to talk about it much more later. Um, Transhumanism would basically say, let's just uh, combine everything, right? I mean, it's not like any more binary between the machine and uh, the human, but we are going to be that. We're gonna, the machines are gonna be part of us. So um, the singularity and transhumanism. Um, the singularity um, has been